Welcome to another part of the ISM course in Statistics 1. This time with a unit on the chi squared statistic and the contingency coefficient. Let's first off start with a slightly different topic with so called contingency or cross tables. And that's tables which or yeah, tables which look like this. So we have basically two variables, one variable has all the different characteristics listed in the rows and the other one in the columns. So we have a variable A and variable B. This could be, for example, classified data, where we have different groups on the one, different groups on the other part. In the table itself, that's the gray-wise shaded areas, we have the absolute frequencies for each coupling of values. So the n11, n21, n22 up to nkl, that's the absolute frequencies. And then on the borders we see the n1 dot or the n.1, n.2, that's the so-called marginal frequencies. That's basically the absolute values for each of the two variables seen separately. Or in other words, that's the sum of the corresponding row or the sum of the corresponding column. So the n1 dot, that's n11 plus n12 plus n13 up to plus n1l. So all of them are added up. The same for the corresponding n.1, which is n11 plus n and 2, 1, so forth, up to plus n, k1. Okay, so much for the theoretical background on cross tables. In practical to, uh, aspects, they could look something like this. We have as different rows, the cities which we observe, and as different columns, well, the way people travel, commute to work, like car, public transport, by foot or by bike. Then we have the different absolute frequencies for each combination and in the lower part or on the right hand we have the sums so the marginal frequencies and in the absolute lower right we have the overall number of observations. So here we have 3000 observations. With those values we can then start and discuss how to calculate the chi squared statistic. Before we, however, do this, we do one special case. And that's a case where we only have a 2 times 2 table, because for the 2 times 2 tables, we can much easier than with the chi squared calculate the so called Yule coefficient. This is, as seen here, a table like this, which only has four entries n11, n12, n21, and n22. And for those, the Yule coefficient is calculated as follows. As we see here, this value can actually take negative and positive values. So it might tell you something about the direction of the relationship. That's one of the big downsides of chi squared, chi squared or even contingency coefficients. They only tell you something about the strength of the relation. They do not tell you anything about the direction. This you have to determine via the different values from the contingency table. Here you might get a first idea whether they are related as the um, diagonal elements are the largest ones or the counter diagonal ones are the largest ones. So this gives you an idea in which the direction goes. Okay, but as I said, it's limited to 2 by 2. Chi squared, contingency coefficient, can be used for any type of contingency tables. So let's take a closer look at them. For this, first off, we calculate the so called expected frequencies, the EIJ. The EIJ is simply calculated by multiplying the marginal frequency for the column and the marginal frequency for the row. All of this is divided by the number of observations n. We do this for all our entries. So if we have a 2 times 2 table, 
so four entries, we need to calculate four expected frequencies. If we have a three by four table, we need to calculate 12 expected frequencies. So for each absolute frequency, we will get an expected frequency. Here we have this in a table. We can see the E11 is N1 dot times N dot one divided by N. The same for the other three as well. Well, okay, then we have one table with the absolute values, the original values, and one table with the expected frequencies. If we have this, we can actually relatively easily get our chi squared statistic by just calculating the difference between the original values, the nij, and the expected values, eij. This difference is then squared and divided by the expected values, by the eij. And this is done for all our entries. So if we have a 2 times 2 table, we do this 4 times. This is the two sums here in the formula. This just means do this for all entries. Well, this is relatively easy. However, the sheet squared has one big downside. Okay, basically has more than one downside. One we mentioned cannot say anything about the direction, can only say something about the strength of the relation. And it takes values between zero and infinity. Well, meaning well if we have a lower bound so if it's very close to zero it's a very weak relation however we do not know what a strong relation actually means is a strong relation also already present if we have like a value of three or only starting at 10 100 2000 something like this so it's relatively hard to actually give a decent um, evaluation about the real strength of the relation and that's where we take two additional aspects into account. The first is, as I said, chi squared consists of one term per entry in our contingency table. So a 2 times 2 gives four different terms to be added up. A 3 times 3 already gives nine different parts to be added up. So one part which we need to include is the size of the table. Another part is, well, if we have more observations, so a larger n, then there's more room for discrepancies, meaning we also need in some way to control for the number of observations. That's two points we'll take into account in the next step when we talk about the contingency coefficient. If we go about this, first off, we take into account the number of observations. And this is done by switching from chi squared to the contingency coefficient, the normal contingency coefficient as defined here, which is the square root of chi squared divided by chi squared plus the number of observations. This is then limited as well, but it's not limited by one or any decently graspable number. The upper bound is defined in some way by the size of the table. So it might make sense to correct for the size of the table as well. This is done by switching to the corrected contingency coefficient by Pearson. This is by multiplying the contingency coefficient with this correction term of square root of m divided by m minus 1. m here being the minimum of i and j, whereas i is the number of rows and j is the number of columns. So we take a look which is the smallest of the two and then go m divided by m minus 1 square root and multiply this with the contingency coefficient. This has one big upside because the corrected contingency coefficient, this one always takes a value between 0 and 1. So we have a decent frame of reference. Values close to 0 mean weak relationship, values close to 1 mean relatively strong correlate, um, relationship, not correlation, relationship. Well, this is basically all on how to calculate those values. 
So before we close this session, few comments on the side on this. As we've seen for both parts, the g squared statistic and the contingency coefficient, we only need frequency tables or more or less contingency tables like two dimensional frequency table. So we only need frequencies. To get frequencies, we only need to be able to count. This means that our g squared statistic and therefore the contingency coefficient can also be calculated for nominal data. This is actually the most prudent way to go about this. Use it only for nominal data, potentially for ordinal data, if only a very limited number of observations exist or characteristics exist per variable. Do not use this for metric data because the g squared statistic has one big requirement. Each of the entries in the contingency table should be larger or should be larger than zero, should ideally be larger than five. And it needs that each of the marginal frequencies is different from zero. So you need to have decently enough observations per each of the different subgroups. This cannot be achieved if you work with metric data. So g squared is like the archetypical solution to consider whether two metrically scaled variables are in some way related. Doesn't say in which way, but says whether they are related in some way. Well, and with this final comment, I would like to conclude this session. I hope you liked it. And if you want to see more of this type of videos, feel free to visit the playlist in regards to this session and the corresponding course. I say goodbye and see you next time.